speaker for the day uh, as another housekeeping announcement now because we have a large number here so it would be great if you could instead of kind of you know asking the question if you have some question in you know uh, in between so if you could type the question for us then i can read it out to show it uh, or else we can actually take the questions one by one you know after the presentation so with that uh, it's it has always been a pleasure to uh, introduce you know dr shorit patacharya uh, and i can actually see in the offing that he's soon going to join the league for whom we generally say he needs no introduction but for the time being uh, a peek into you know his uh, very commendable <coughs> uh, journey uh, after Uh, illustrious career in in uh, presidency college jadavpur university and center for social sciences uh, shorit completed his phd in the university in, in the university of warwick uh, and then came back to india for a brief stint in iit roorkee Uh, currently, he is teaching in University of Glasgow as a lecturer in post-colonial studies. Uh, now, his publications are too many to name, but I'm just going to name a few uh, because that's what the custom is. So, um, he has published in Aerial Textual Practice, Interventions, Irish Literary Review, uh, and edited books such as uh, Cambridge Critical Concept and Magic Realism. the aesthetics and politics of global hunger etc uh, his areas of interest uh, includes south asia environmental uh, literary studies translation marxist critical theory and literary forms his forthcoming uh, monograph uh, a fascinating book the reaction it traverses a long journey uh, from uh, bhavani bhattacharya to ravarun bhattacharya and he's going to tell us a little more about that so uh, that that has it has been the, i think the e copy has been published so we are waiting for the hard copy which is going to kind of come out next month so his first monograph post colonial modernity and the indian novel on catastrophic realism it's coming out next month and we hope to uh, we are looking forward to it show it i'm not going to stand between the audience and uh, you know your very fascinating um, talk that we were kind of eagerly looking forward to so over to you show it thank you uh, thank you so much first of all i would like to thank uh, dr antar chatterjee for the the kind invitation um, am i audible on corner yes you're audible okay yes. all right um, yes and uh, thank you so much uh, dr onupurna mukherjee for the kind invitation and i think the last time um, i spoke at st xavier's university um, you we also um, sort of introducing me and making me feeling very embarrassed at some point but i had to uh, i had to digest that as well uh, anyway like these are all things that we do as academics nothing more nothing less so um, just to get to the um, get to the talk itself as onupurna um, has already kindly said that uh, this is part of the book that um, as um, sort of what i i am working on at the same time what we um, sort of have been discussing for some time as well about how uh, literature represents catastrophe and um, this is going to be the main uh, argument main agenda of the talk today that what is it that literature does um in order to capture a moment of catastrophe and um this is also something that i that i've tried to do in some way in my book uh, where part of the talk comes from as well um a book that i'll be giving you um an idea about throughout this talk what uh, i was doing there in 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 that work so what i plan to do is share a screen and this is the first time i'm giving a talk on google meet so uh, please bear with me if there is um any problem but these are like a few uh, slides i have that i wanted to share with you um right is so it, is, it, is it there is a um, there is a present now icon right what's the end uh, yeah at the bottom can you end. see uh, if i do the present if i do it this way can you see the screen now not yet i can't see it yet okay all right uh, because uh, the problem is the last time i tried uh, the share button is not activated so that i could share um, some of these things just a uh, just a moment please so yeah i can see present uh, now 
and there are options such as your entire screen a window a chrome tab so if i go for your entire screen yeah right uh that's where i thought the yeah that's the problem that the share button here is not activated um yeah i'll just have a quick look if it is something to do with here So um, yeah, so is it is it still not coming onto the screen? Well, sometimes it takes a few moments. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, uh, please bear with me. If it doesn't come, it is not a huge thing. I'll just go on. Um, it should touch. It come. If you would really like to share it, you could send it to one of us and we could try. Yes, we can do that. Yeah, I you can send, send it right. to Natasha. Yeah. yeah, I mean, uh, so, right. So I'll just like re reply to Onuporna's email a few days back. So this is, um, uh, this is right there. Yeah, I've just uh, sent it to Onuporna's Iser. Um, yeah, that should do. I'll it to you. Yeah, yeah. yeah, in case it doesn't work, not a problem. But I just wanted to have one poem by. Uh, oh, the Guzar. poem you want to write? Okay, okay, that's with Natasha. We can play that. Yeah, and there is the other. Uh, I've just sent you this uh, presentation link in case. So there are a couple of uh, poems. One by Gulzar, another by Tapsi Panu uh, in a recent, in a recent uh, rendition. So I just wanted to make sure that if these two poems could be uh, read out, or if people, my viewers, can uh, listen to it, then uh, the talk could be like situated much better. But in any way, just let me know. I've just sent you the email. Um, sure. Just let me know what it, whether it's working. Yeah, sure. So when you need Gulzar's poem, like let it work. It's, we are already ready with that. Uh, right. The other, you know, it will take some time, I guess. Right. It's all right. Um, so by the time it comes out, uh, let me uh, start with let me start with um, what is uh, as I said at the beginning. The main talk is about um, sort of how literature represents catastrophe. And let me go with one by one because it's a talk that is also given to um, to Iser Vopal and to um, to a more sort of both a literary and a non-literary audience, so to say. So let me go one by one. What I mean by literature here is that um, it's OK. I'll, I'll give you a very um, quick definition that comes from Oxford English Dictionary that literature is, um, in short, pieces of writing that are valued as works of art, especially novels, plays, and poems, in contrast to technical books and newspapers, magazines, etc. Uh, another definition they give is written works, especially those considered of superior or lasting artistic merit. Now, this is something I wanted you to remember that literature is something which which creates value. It is artistic. It creates something that is lasting artistic merit or uh, sort of timelessness. This is something that's the definition of literature that comes to our mind. Now, what is the definition of catastrophe? Again, um, again from Oxford English Dictionary, just keep it uniform. Uh, the definition is a sudden event that causes many people to suffer. A sudden event, something which, which falls abruptly. Cata and the word catastrophe comes from the Greek word kata meaning down, strophe meaning turning, something to turn from what is, let's say, usual, normal, everyday, a kind of a rupture. Now, these two things I wanted to bring together precisely because they do not go side by side. Something which is a rupture is also something which is temporally very specific. And literature is something which talks about something of lasting impact. Does literature, or rather can literature, represent things which create ruptures in a long-term understanding of history? If I ask you, how many literary works you remember that are 
uh, specifically based on catastrophes or something that will automatically uh, be regarded as like great pieces of literature, you would actually find very few pieces of novels, poetry and plays that are based on catastrophes such as an earthquake or such as, let's say, a famine coming to your mind. Those which are dealing with larger social crisis will probably get to your mind much faster because larger social crisis has given birth to, in the more fictional sense, let's say realism, let's say how to represent reality. It is not any uniform understanding of realism, but let's say that realism was born with the understanding of a social crisis with the ascendance of, let's say, the bourgeois mercantile class and the social crisis of class, gender, race and society that society had to face. So I'll not get into the nitty gritty right now. I just wanted you to remember that literature means something of lasting impact and catastrophe is something which is temporary, ruptural, sudden. And this is going to be very important precisely because we are going through currently right now we are going through a moment which we have not seen before my father who is born in the 50s says he has not seen anything or seen anything such uh, of this of this nature where i'm i'm based in glasgow and he's based in a remote town in alipurduar both of us are going through the same situation the same kind of tension and the same global lockdown we talk about how we are sort of you know stuck home so this is something which is absolutely new and this new is also giving us challenges to understand how we understand the present how we understand that people are dying people are suffering immensely and at the same time we are seeing them in a more of a distance manner through uh, media because we can't go outside mostly and we know people are dying but we don't know them don't see them we know people are suffering but we don't see them actually but we feel helpless vulnerable most of the times not to be choked anger this is an because of some of the literary question if you are going to ask uh, give it some kind of a form so this is something i i just wanted to have um, an understanding about i can see that on my screen um uh, the talk is uh, present so can you use uh, the powerpoint now if you can then could you just go to the next slide if possible yes sir so this is something that I wanted to uh, show that literature is something of lasting impact and catastrophe is sudden. So could you just go to the first um, the first article, uh, Indian Express article, if possible? Um, yeah. So this is something I wanted to show to you. If it is uh, if it is possible to sort of play this, um, this is uh, you you have to control and click on it. You have to press control button and then click on it. Oh uh, yes. So is it visible? Uh, I can see that, but if you just uh, press the like hold the control button and then press on the link, then it will show up. Uh, yes, actually, I have already um, opened it. Okay, uh, it's not coming up in any way. Uh, it so might is it not, the Gulzar video? Yes, it is the Gulzar video. Uh, okay, I, I'll just play it. So this is a poem by. Uh, by Gulzar, one of the most celebrated lyricists and poets from India. Um, and this is about the migrant crisis that um, that, he has, that he has written. And I'm not too sure whether it could be played because of the logistical problems. Uh, I'll just wait for like maybe a minute. If it is not played, I'll just go on and tell you what he's writing about. Uh, meanwhile, I have the poem, uh, parts of the poem in Hindi, uh, because it's written in Hindi, so I'll just read it out if it is not working. Uh, the poem is, yes, so the poem starts with Mahamari lagi thi, gharo ko bhaag liya the, bhaag liye the savi, majdur karigar machine band hone lag gai thi, shahar ki sari unhi se haath pao chalte rehte the, भगरना जिंदगी तो गांव ही में 
वो कर आए थे एज इट गोज ऑन इन 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 इंग्लिश बिकॉज आई एम श्योर लाइक सम ऑफ आस वुड बी नॉन हिंदी स्पीकर एज वेल सो द पॉइंट इज द एपिडेमिक हैव टेकन ओवर ऑल द लेबर लेबर एंड वर्कर्स वेर रनिंग टूवर्ड्स देयर होम्स the machines in the city had stopped working the ones that were responsible for their livelihood the ones for which they had left their lives behind in their villages and it goes on uh, uh, the second so step is um uh, if it's if it is if it is not a problem then please go on yeah, I, yeah. it's like a very tiny Mama, poem it's like Mama, one Mama, minute gharon ko bhag सभी मजदूर कारीगर मशीनें बंद होने लग गई थी शहर की सारी उन्हीं से हाथ पाँव चलते रहते थे मशीनें बंद होने लग गई थी शहर की सारी उन्हीं से हाथ पाँव चलते रहते थे रोजाना जिंदगी तो गांव ही में बो के आ रहे थे वो एकड़ और दो एकड़ जमीन या पांच एकड़ कटाई और बुआई सब वही तो थी जवारी धान मक्की बाजरी सब वो बटवारे चचेरे और ममेरे भाइयों से फसाद नाले पे और नालों पे झगड़े लठैत अपने कभी उनके वो नानी दादी और दादू के मुकदमे सगाई शादियां खलियान सूखा बाढ़ हर बार आसमां बरसे न बरसे मरेंगे तो वहीं जाकर जहां पर जिंदगी है यहां तो जिस्म लाकर प्लग लगाए थे निकाले प्लग सभी ने चलो अब घर चले और चल दिए सब मरेंगे तो वहीं जाकर जहां पर जिंदगी है महामारी लगी थी घरों को भाग लिए थे सभी मजदूर कारीगर या थैंक यू सो मच फॉर प्लेइंग दिस कैन वी गो बैक टू द स्लाइड इफ पॉसिबल Yes, sir. I'll just change it. Yeah. Meanwhile, um, it's it's played. So as you can understand that what Gurzar is writing about is um, is the impact that that COVID had on the migrants and the point that you know life was not life like in the cities will die when. we get back to villages a bit of a what i see there if you can if you can understand that there is a lot of pathos that we call in literary or aesthetic sense the pathos that uh, we we uh, that there is there was a pandemic and uh, people had to go back people had to go back in 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 huge uh, amount of sort of queues walking 400 500 kilometers now if we could just go to the second slide and this is from a uh, bollywood actor uh, tapsi pannu uh the second not the second slide the second uh, link that is given there she has recently written a poem called uh, probasi uh, probasi in bangla or probasi um in hindi and uh, this is also about migrant laborers i just wanted to show you this to to get an understanding about the kind of responses uh, also in aesthetic sense the responses that uh, this kind of a rupture uh, is giving birth to so should so i play it? yes please go on oh. please thank you Uh, i can promise that this is the last one let's turn from that to a complete switch in mood it's saturday night and this is where we usually bring our saturday night special today's guest is the bollywood actor tapsi pannu her poem titled pravasi on the plight of migrants has gone viral on the internet before we go to tapsi listen in to this rather moving poem that she's done with where she spoken on migrants hum to bas pravasi hain kya is desh ke wasi hain 
अगर हम नहीं है इंसान तो मार दो हमें दे दो फरमान खाने को तो कुछ ना मिल पाया भूख लगी तो डंडा खाया फासले तय किए हजारों मील के कुछ साइकिल पर कुछ पैर नंगे मरे कई भूख से और कई धूप से पर हिम्मत ना टूटी बड़ों के झूठ से बस से भेजकर रेल से भेजकर जान खो बैठे रास्ते भूलकर यहां प्रतिमाओं की बड़ी हस्ती पर इंसानों की जान है सस्ती बड़े सपने अच्छे दिन बतलाए पर भूख किसी की मिटा ना पाए ना भीख ना दान बस ना छीनो आत्मसम्मान हम तो बस प्रवासी हैं क्या इस देश के वासी हैं या यू कुड जस्ट कट इट फ्रॉम हियर दे दे गोइंग टू गो इन योर डिस्कशन या एंड गेट बैक टू द स्लाइड्स इफ यू कैन yeah uh thank you so much uh, for playing this video as well um the point is i i will not go analyze these two poems it's up to it's it's open for you uh but it just this much is that while gulzar's poem uh, to me was more of holding up capturing the pathos of the situation in a more broad sense tapsi pannu's poem was more of a direct response to some of the scenes that we have seen and the graphic video sort of also captures your emotions and you know that you have seen these things in the last few days and you have felt bad you have felt vulnerable so this is the two things this is broadly where i wanted to set this discussion is that if the the the, the living catastrophe demands responses which are deeply emotional intensely emotional affective and at the same time they are also political because they want to make a point to the people they want to criticize critique it probably would be the term to find out to see where where we have failed a whole generation and uh, it is look at that nothing none of these points is about the tiny virus that's changing our lives because the virus doesn't have the so called subjectivity to talk about right the impact of it becomes more important so this is where i feel like the responses from 30 years from now might be that these are immediate responses and very emotional they do not have the lasting impact of art so this is the moot the moot question where does literature have to change itself in order to represent capture a catastrophe what changes in aesthetics uh, does it bring forth and this is where and can we talk about this kinds of literature um, as great art or other or rather when we talk about great art or art as such what do we what kind of perception do we have in mind so this is uh, partly also what comes from the book so if you can go to the next uh, slide right so uh, my discussions is mostly about the 1943 bengal famine also one of the chapters in the book so let me give you like again a very quick definition from oxford dictionary a famine is a lack of food during a long period of time in a region a severe famine disasters such as floods and famine set of widespread famine famine relief etc so basically famine is one of the disasters one of the catastrophes and most of the times some of these catastrophes such as a cholera outbreak or such as a plague will probably lead to famine because of the uh, food shortages and because of people dying uh, because of this social distancing in a much broader broader sense now 1943 bengal famine has mostly been i'll not get into the nitty gritty again about some of these scholarly studies but some of the reasons that have come out in the last uh, let's say four decades or so by scholars such as bm bhatia amartya sen david arnold madhushree mukherji janam mukherji and others is that famine uh, the famine could be because of the second world war the casualty sort of a collateral uh, disaster could be because of food hoarding that was going on at that point of time could be about 
good administrative failures that uh, the statesman as a newspaper was pointing out all the time could be about the communal and caste issues in relief patterns. That's something recent historians are also talking about much more forcefully. So these are the things we have to keep in mind. And mostly in the last, I think uh, it is IIT Gandhi, it is IIT Gandhi never scientists who have come out with the uh, recent discovery that it is the only famine in the in 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 all the six or seven major famines during the colonial period, which was not based um, not because of climate uh, the climate issues such as a, a shortage of rainfall, etc. It, it they found through a soil um, sort of soil uh, uh, experimentation and um, uh, evaluation that this famine was because of the war and administrative failures. Something that the journalists and writers during 1940s, the stormy decade, would call a man-made. It would come out to us as something which is um, baseless. This is not un this is unscientific because most of the times governments will deny that these are man-made because that's a failure. But this term was very much you know sort of uh, doing the rounds back then. And most of the most of the writings would talk about uh, a man-made aspect of the famine. So if you can go to this next slide. Right. So this is what is happening. I'd like to talk about is that what kind of emotional response of uh, the famine uh, sort of the writers had to go through. Now, this is uh, the first one is from Bhavani Bhattacharya, who is writing a book called So Many Hungers, published in August 1947, which is just a few we like few days after um, uh, we got independence from the colonial rule. So what is he saying here? Uh, I'm not reading out before that. Just, uh, uh, just to give you a tiny bit of information that Bhavani Bhattacharya uh, came to do his PhD in urban social history, um, social history of the 1860s and 70s at University College London. And he went back, he wanted to be a trans uh, translator, he translated some of uh, Rabindranath uh, Tagore's poem, and then um, he, he wanted to write um, a novel called music for Mohini, as far as I remember, but he had to, so this is what he writes, we, what he rather says in an interview um, published in Contemporary Novelist later on, um, that the emotional stirrings I felt, more than two million men, women and children died of slow starvation and a man-made scarcity, were a sheer compulsion to creativity. The result was the novel So Many Hungers. So this is something that I wanted to give you an understanding that they, they are compelled to write. Some, if you are going through something like that, uh, a writing uh, a, a pandemic or a catastrophe of this nature where you feel vulnerable, you are doing your job, you're trying to help people out through whatever means possible, but you uh, still see people dying outside on the street because of food. Uh, sort of carcasses and corpses outside. So this is the tension that 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 is there. That what do you do other than write and make people aware? And the emotional stirrings I felt. Remember that, and remember some of these videos of Gulzar and Tapsi Parno, some of the responses that are coming out. Then this is again another quote from Bijan Bhattacharya. Bijan Bhattacharya is um, uh, is, uh, is, a, is a noted uh, novelist, uh, sorry, a playwright, and also an activist during the 1940s. And one of his uh, famous most noted uh, uh, plays would be Novan or New or New Harvest, 1944 publication uh, or release. So this is what he he, he was saying to Shomik Bandhavanta, and which came out in this book, uh, Rehearsals of Revolution. This is what he said: I saw the people dying like cats and dogs in the streets of Calcutta, muttering, fumbling. Could I reach my ears both to them? This was my only thought. I would go to many places and sit thinking, what to write, what to do how to do, just to gauge the depth of their suffering. While going on like this, I thought that if I wrote a drama and actually produced it, would it be worthwhile? So this is again, again, a kind of literary form or genre being discovered, invented, brought out because of the pressures of the time. So this is the coming to being of Bijan Bhattacharya as a, as a playwright. So this is something I wanted to give to you. That some of how some of the so the some of the uh, writers um, and artists of the time period were thinking about the famine. So if you can go back to the next slide now. Right. So this is from uh, Bhavani Bhattacharya's novel, So Many Hungers. I wanted to give you a, a feel of the text. Like, what is he doing in that text? So something that I've argued in the book, that the kind of mode that he uses, I've called it an analytical affective mode. This is part of the book, or majority of the book, is 
uh, about analysis, where he is anal analyzing why uh, the, the current uh, situation is actually uh, because of imperialism or colonialism, or why is it related with uh, the famine. And he is because, as I said, he's a historian. He did his PhD in history. The, the historian academic part is coming through in these writings. Um, and and look at and but at the same time, he's he's also a widely read writer, immensely influenced by. Uh, such a people such as John dos pesos um, sort of Steinberg and others so um, a lot of a lot of these things are coming to his mind as well at the same time he's he's reading a lot about by Premchand the kind of progressive writing series um, happening in India in the 1930s and 40s so this is a particular passage that I wanted to read out um, or um, uh, sort of give you as an example so this is uh, in the middle uh, not in the middle in the beginning where he's saying, Gold rush in Clive Street, a motley crowd surging by the stock exchange, pulses pounding, the blood beating in the ears, the crowd with cash in the banks, cash to play with, buy munitions of war, things that make guns, shells. No rubber shares in the market, a telegram to Singapore does the trick. Send first telegrams to Singapore, shape up Singapore. But have you to buy with? Open your passbooks, empty your accounts, take a loan from friends, mortgage your house, sell, sell your gold, the gold in the body of your wife. Now, this is something, and I'm not, uh, some of these dots you see, these are actually from the book. I'm not sort of shortening it. Um, these are not ellipses in, uh, in, in, in the more um, sort of shortening sense. So this, this, you know, if you read the novel, you'll see that it is going, uh, this is kind of more of a realist novel where somebody slowly opening up um, the scene and then slowly the characters and you know you, you have a feel of the atmosphere etc that's how you feel like things are, are going on uh, and you are with them but suddenly you find that passages like that which show to some extent not only uh, a sort of an analytic analytical bent but also something which is um, I found much more like um, sort of informative so this is something that I that I wrote is that uh, this is a remarkable picture of the rise of wartime stock markets, the sheer madness of the profit economy, the pounding pulses, the rash speculations and the liquidation of material property. Note the passages staccato rhythm that imitates the speed of the key element of the share market information. The passage directs our attention to how the stock economy creates its own market especially in the example of rubber shares, where the necessary material can be sold on the basis of rumors or communications, reminding us of Karl Pugliani's notion of the self-regulating nature of capital and its production of fictitious commodities. Now, this kind of documentary realist prose, reminiscent of uh, Dos Pesos and Steinbeck, manages to uh, convey the hurried actions of the city's middle class for holding and black marketing materials that will be needed for war. So what I wanted to point out is that as if the the pounding pulses, the, the, the sheer energy of the prose is trying to capture the uh, sheer energy of the middle class in order to capture the wealth. So that's the reproduction that literature is trying to do here. But at the same time, he's, he's not stopping there. He's not just like analyzing. This next quote, um, is something where I I, 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 I I feel like a deeply affective spirit, that's precisely why I use the term analytical affective mode, affective spirit is brought into uh, this fold. So the documentary spirit is juxtaposed with abundant imagery of social violence, where one image follows another, making the novel look like a reportage in sections. I, um, yes, so um, this also partly um, the affective form. So. A quick, a quick um, kind of uh, snapshots. What is happening here? When the famine breaks out in the city and corpses are everywhere on the street, one of the characters is known as Rahul. He finds in a busy railway station an artist drawing the sketch of a child suckling off a dead mother. The scene invites commuters who gradually turn into an agitated mob accusing the artist of his neglected duties. After being asked by the station master, why has he not reported the incident to them? The artist replies, what am I doing but trying to make a report? Not to the railway people. I have to report to India, unquote. Reminding us of famine artists like Chitto Prashad, Somnath Hor, Joinul Abedin and others who sketched the horrors of the famine and published them in national dailies to critique the unscrupulous and incomprehensibly callous British responses to the event, the scene also hints at a related question, such acts may incur in society, 
namely the accusation against the artist for being a negligent, profit-seeking, insensitive human being. Expectedly enough, the mob starts lynching him. As Rahul collects and hands over his pencil and sketching pad to him, the enraged artist first asserts the importance of the act to Rahul and then speaks in a heavily emotional voice. And I quote again, I can't bear the sight of the mother's corpse, sickening. You think I'm a brute? Unquote. There is a dual meaning of report here, a professional duty and of ethical concern. Would the report to a station master be enough in this mammoth outbreak of violence? The reporter's duty is not only to identify and write or post about this single incident of tragedy, but to render the underlying structures that compel these situations and to inform the public. At the same time, reporting is also a question of the ethical value of producing art. Could an artist stay away from the sensibilities and emotions of humans while manufacturing art in a time of greater historical crisis? A narrator captures in the artist's sickening feelings a subjective attachment to the event. And I quote again uh, on the slide, Rahul sta stared at him. The artist had lost his detachment and with detachment, vision. He seethed with human feeling, unquote. Clearly, it is a complex task to produce art in a time of catastrophe, especially when the additional layer of reflection upon representation is added. There is a further complexity to this given uh, in the next statement. And I quote again, Rahul heaved an unhappy sigh. It seemed to him as though the dead mother on the platform nursing a tiny one now died for the second time, unquote. The narrator seems to suggest to me that with subjective and emotional attachment, artistic representation of a catastrophic crisis becomes hindered or distorted. This act of self-reflexivity brings us back to the fundamental dilemma in catastrophe-based art, and it is, how does one tackle the material issues of an immediate horrible tragedy and yet reflect upon the tragedy at the same time? And this is something, as we have noted, Bijan Bhattacharya uh, was also thinking about how to do art in a time of catastrophe. And both of them, that is something that I have found out in my readings, that both of them have turned to a localization of emotions, be it through using local words, local imagery, a sort of, um, a sort of a feel of, let's say, uh, the geographic a feel of the specialized emotions. That's where he has, they have gone to. Something that I don't want to get into right now. These are all um, sort of translated and available easily. So you could just like find out how they do it. But just to move on to the next um, uh, sort of slide, just for, for time, this is from a, a, a novel that I wanted to uh, give you in the beginning. And this is now from a poem. And uh, some of the uh, Bengali audiences here might know the poem already. Uh, that is, oh, great life, no more poetry. Again, this is from Shukanto Bhattacharya, somebody who uh, died very young, unfortunately, um, of tuberculosis on, uh, in 1947. He was born in 1926 at the age of 21. And Shukanto, even then, even at the age of 21, Shukanto has uh, left a lot of poetry, at least one full book of poetry. And this probably is his best poem um, to me apart from a few others, of course, because the, because of the brevity within which Shukanta could talk about uh, the famine and could talk about hunger and the tension um, that he feels, that he feels all the time. He was an activist, he was a communist, he was an activist, and he, he was also um, an editor of a children's magazine, and he would be writing, he would be helping out, uh, something that I find a lot of the people, even today, some of the people, some of the students from universities and colleges doing everything possible during Amphan and during even during the, uh, the crisis, the crisis that coronavirus outbreak has um, sort of opened up. So this is something which we could always expect from younger minds and students to do and also at the same time faculties etc to take part um, uh, as, 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 as citizens of civil society so to say. Now what is this poem? This poem is uh, this eight line poem. So I'll just read out and uh, some of you might not know this poem that oh great life no more poetry again. Let me instead invoke heart and sturdy prose. Let the soft lilting of words and their jingling be gone. Let the steep hammer of prose strike close. 
There is no need of the softness of poetry. I grant you leave today, poetry, my mate. In the land of hunger, prose is everywhere. The full moon hangs like a piece of fire-baked bread. Now, the last line is probably the most widely quoted and used. And um, this is something which probably it would take so much for us to imagine, like what it, what a poet, what a poet is going through to write a line like that, uh, compose a compose a sentence like that. So um, probably, um, probably it, it demands like the kind of response that Tapsi Panus has come out. Um, uh, or Gulzar. Gulzar is a noted writer. Tapsi Pano might be uh, an amateur writer or might be a professional writer, we didn't know, but the response that it comes out is something that is intensely emotional and uh, and some of the imagery is coming out as well. And Shukanto is also it's very at a very tender age and going through a horrible decade of famine, war, communal riots, whatnot. So this is the kind of poetry and this is a final bit. So this is in 1947, a year that he died and poetry is slowly becoming more and more uh, stiff in, in, in a sense, we are not, it is not the right word, brief, the brevity of it all, but more striking, more striking. What I wanted to talk about is that here uh, again, because this, we are coming to the final bits, uh, so bear with me. The um, Right, so the this, this particular um, particular uh, understanding here is that uh, one should not write poetry. Um, this is not the time of poetry. So this is something that I that I um, that I feel like that the poem raises the complaint complaint that poetry cannot be under, un, cannot understand the prosaic harsh reality of current life. But what kind of poetry is this? It specifies that this is the kind of poetry that involves the lilting of words and their jingling, and a certain softness, indicating that the lyrical and subjective is turn in the modernist Bengali poetry also modernist European poetry, and pointing to his world as the land of hunger, Shukanto asserts that this form of poetry cannot speak adequately to the current socio-economic and historical crisis. The world needs prose now, unsentimental, lackluster, hard prose in poetry. In order to stress this hard nature, Shukanto uses a juridical image, like the stiff hammer of prose strike close. There is both assertion here for hard prose and a reference to the hammer in court, the thudding of which brings order to chaos and crisis. The juridical conceit is emphasized in the following line where the poet, quote unquote, grants leave to poetry. The comparison of poetry to a maid who has ostensibly been granted leave by her master has, however, a problematic gender dimension here as if lyrical poetry was something feminine and if femininity was something weak or incompatible. The final image, which is logically built as a conclusion from the crisis in the world and the need for a strong prose in poetry is one of the most memorable ones in modern Bengali poetry. The moon is compared to a fire-baked braid. This is striking and modern because the moon in the post Rabindranath romantic tradition of Bengali poetry has dominantly been related with inspiration, love, feminine beauty and atmospheric charm. Shukanto not only challenges such imagination by but establishes the prosaic, unimaginative and raspy dimension of contemporary reality in relations to the moon. Through this image, Shukanto once again projects the embodied aspect of his poetic imagination, the moon a non-living object is imagined by hungry people as a supplier of food and livelihood. Also in a perverse way, Shukanto qualifies that he doesn't mean poetry and poetic imagination to die. The brilliance of the image is an attestation there, but once a certain form of poetry, lyrical, subjective and detached from social reality to disappear in the face of the urgency of the current times. His poetry, so the striking and modernist images through his innovative logical structuring and his use of bare diction and direct references announces a newness in poetic form that is intimately associated with the catastrophic consciousness of the current times, which is taken from Barbara Harlow, who has written a fantastic book called Resistance Literature. It can be said in conclusion that Sukanto's poetry appears, and I quote from Bar uh, Harlow, both as a force for mobilizing a collective response to occupation and domination and as a repository for popular memory and consciousness, something that Harlow calls a documentary or realistic poetry. Now, 
the point here that I, as I, as I wanted to uh, get get to you, that both in these cases, and if we could go to the uh, uh, next slide. Right. So both in the cases, we could see that this catastrophe is giving birth to a social urgency and literature is uh, literature or art is being produced in the sense of this urgency. They are. I'm not going into the term realism right now. It's a big term and we could talk about it in Q&A if you're interested. That's why I didn't want to talk about in the title about realism as such, but the book does talk about it. The point being that they are, if we can take it in that way, that they are realist because they're talking about the social reality in a more urgent at the same time, uh, uh, sort of transparent sense. Then at the same time, they're having to think about how to write about it. I can see that people are dying, people are bypassing uh, carcasses and corpses and getting to the office uh, on the street. So how do I sort of capture this immense rupture in uh, everyday everyday life, everyday thinking and bring it back to a uh, poem? So we can see that both Sukanto and Bhavani Bhattacharya, they, they're sort of struggling with it. Bijan is also, everybody's struggling with how to give it form. And in order to give it form that reproduces the time, what happens is that both of these writings, both of these, some of these um, sort of ventures are criticized widely by literary critics or uh, um, sort of art critics later on. So one of the responses, as, I, as you can see, to Bhavani Bhattacharya's novel, uh, So Many Hungers, was that by C. Paul Varugis um, in, in the book Bhavani Bhattacharya, is that an artist who turns recent events into fiction cannot easily succeed. For the unconscious mind requires much time to perform its wonder of transmuting incidents into art. There is nothing wrong in these sentences, uh, in this particular um, uh, sort of couple of sentences. Now, the, the point was that, that the, the work, the novel, didn't work for uh, Varugis because um, the kind of uh, the kind of let's say um, things that uh, or the kind the way that Bhavani Bhattacharya uh, talked about art or sort of produced art was not let's say what is understood as artistic. Now, this is something I want to uh, sort of get to the ending with that what critics at the time or in any time seem to miss in their conventional understandings of art is that the literary representation of catastrophes or disasters might demand certain immediate or long-term changes and mutations within existing forms and aesthetics. The question should not be, to me, whether the novel appears as a perfectly structured or homogeneously stylistic uh, work of art, some sort of a preconceived notion of art, but rather what levels of rupture in cognition the novelist has endured in order to address the huge cataclysm and trauma as a witness or a contemporary and the pressures that these thus placed on form. From such a perspective, the very incoherence or mixture of aesthetics and styles could be themselves considered a literary innovation that itself bears witness to the experientiality of rupture or crisis. Writing immediately after the famine, Bhavani or Shukanto intended their uh, writings to play the role of both a historical document bearing witness and a literary medium that conveys the subjective experiences of collective tragedy and their self-reflexive emotions. Furthermore, through the predominant use of a sort of an anti-colonial analytical effective realist form, sort of a documentary realist poetry, the reminders that Indian independence was preceded by a dire moment of socio-ecological crisis, and that to challenge and tackle the legacies of this crisis, sort of a visionary politics of humanistic ideals would be needed. Now, this is something uh, I, I, I read uh, in, my, in my work. Of course, the, the complications are there. But just to give you like a final understanding uh, of what is happening from here is that plenty of critics in the last two decades or so, starting with, let's say, Mihir Bhattacharya, who has written uh, uh, a novel, uh, sorry, uh, an essay called Realism and the Syntax of Difference, comparing um, uh, Manik Bandopadhyay's novel Chintamoni and Bibhuti Bhushan Bandopadhyay's novel Oshoni Shonket. Uh, both of these novels are a response to 
the famine, the 1943 Bengal famine, comparing these two and finding out where exactly they are using things differently. That the same people writing at the same time, 1944 publications, using different ways of engaging with the famine. Um, and then in the next uh, decade or so, more uh, sort of critics have talked about, like, such as uh, Rob Nixon, talking about an environmental, uh, so his book is called Slow Violence. If famine is a slow violence, it will demand a figurative form, which is different from others. So Mark Anderson is talking about how disaster narratives in different geographies have demanded different kinds of disaster style. So Upamano Pablo Mukherjee in another book on Victorian uh, famines and uh, epidemics, talking about disaster style, are calling for disaster disasters uh, disaster geographies calling for disaster styles of writing these are things i've dealt with in my in my book where i've kind of, kind of given it a theoretical framework which i call catastrophic realism drawing on some of these theoretical frameworks about how literature needs to go through a radical aesthetic transformation in order to capture a radical time period so final slide and a final um line a sort of a web um this is an article this is not a video the, just to show like how if it is possible uh for you to play this and that will be my last um sort of remark as well okay so this is about, yeah if, if it is possible to uh, this is a scroll article um, and this is about this is about this is I think May 2020. This was published first in the Conversation, uh, another UK magazine. And uh, this is about how it is becoming increasingly difficult for us to uh, understand the poetry that we might not like this poetry, but this is the poetry, uh, or this is the kind of uh, sort of fiction that is coming out more and more, and we have to bear with it. Something, uh, the kind of propositions that the author um, gives there. In case it doesn't, uh, yeah, I'll just, uh, yeah. So if you just go scroll uh, down, I'll just, I don't want to read uh, this, just scroll down. And there are a few, if you just go, go scroll down, again, scroll down. Um, yes, yes. So, so this, uh, keep it there, keep it there, yeah. Uh, a, a little, uh, I think a little, a little talk. again. Yes, yes. Um, just like a couple of uh, things that he's suggesting. One thing he's suggesting is that you don't have to like it. Poetry is often taught in a very strange way. You are given a poem and told that it's good. You don't have to like this kind of pandemic poems. Then the next suggestion he gives is that read it aloud. It is lives on the sort of the air, not on the page. Read it aloud and don't try and solve it. Just go along with it. So these are some of the suggestions that uh, I mean, I, I don't want. I mean, you can always check it out. This is a May um, uh, sort of 2020 and write your own, etc. The emotions that are coming out if you can. Now, if you can uh, go back to the to the slide again, I mean, I just wanted to make sure that you have a feel of this of this uh, article. If you just go back to the slide again and uh, to the next slide, actually, the final slide, uh, hopefully. So the point is that a lot of these writings are coming out, like Gulzar's response, like let's say Tafsi Panu's response. And I'm, I've seen like so many poems on Twitter and on Facebook, and then also on different kinds of social media, people are writing. So this is something that I have wa I wanted to talk about, is that uh, in, in this book as well, the, this, is the, this is the front page of the book, the, sorry, the cover of the book. So this is something that I wanted to talk about, is that um, if a disaster is a rupture of the everyday time, then how, does art or literature represents catastrophe? What kind of changes and radical transformations in art, literature, and art have to go through? And can we say in the in the in the way that some of the critics would say these are not good art or these are not bad art? Can we sort of actually put this some of these uh, sort of levels onto art, which is coming out of an urgency? Should there be another aesthetic framework to deal with the art of the catastrophe? And this is something that I've dealt with in this book in three or four chapters. So thank you so much for listening. And thank you so much to the team for making sure that some of these slides could be could be shown. Thank you so much. Um, so uh, thank you, Dr. Shorit Pachacharya. A very stimulating uh, lecture, very opposite for our times. Uh, 
Now, of course, you know, you have covered quite a few things, uh, particularly how, how kind of literary genres, how literature kind of responds to, you know, of the crisis, uh, you know, emergent crisis with certain degree of uh, urgency and, and that perpetual question that uh, what should be the role of art in times of pandemic, what should be the role of right. art in terms of, you know, historical um, political economic crisis. So right. uh, we have a set of questions here and I'm sure we'll have many more. In fact, I have quite a few questions, but I, I'll take them one by one. So right. here we have something for, from Dr. Preya Gray from Xavier's University. So right. I think this question is uh, about enclosure farming. So for the uninitiated, uh, enclosure farming was a phenomenon in the, uh, around the Industrial Revolution when uh, you know small land holdings, uh, uh, community lands, the kind of uh, taken away uh, by the large landowners, and it was kind of consolidated under. Uh, large farmer, you know, uh, consolidated uh, uh, by the large farmers and large, you know, landowners, uh, which kind of brought in a certain kind of agrarian revolution. But at the same time, many, uh, you know, uh, small farmers, landowners became kind of, uh, uh, they, they, they were, uh, they became landless. So that led to yeah. a huge migration. So, um, you know, if I may just sort of uh, expand on that question. Yeah, I actually. Sure to qualify that a little bit. Firstly, Shori, thank you so much for this excellent lecture. Uh, so I had a kind of two-pronged question, or you might call them observations. Uh, and they both deal with this initial kind of observation that you made about the uh, disjunct between literature as something that aspires to be sort of timeless and uh, sort of transcend a particular historical moment and a catastrophe, which is very much uh, located in a particular uh, rupture. Uh, and I would, I was actually trying to think of some exceptions to this uh, paradigm. And one was enclosure, which perhaps is not the best example because it happens over several centuries. It is a kind of catastrophe, a climatic environmental catastrophe, but it happens over centuries. And it certainly is canonized in the uh, English literary canon. But more than that, I was actually thinking about war poetry. And someone has just written a comment about uh, the Holocaust. So I was actually thinking about the poetry of the First World War, which I teach which I think would be very uh, interesting to think about uh, within this particular uh, context because of several things. I mean, firstly, it uh, asks us to think about what is the ethics of writing poetry in the middle of uh, you know, a calamity like this. Uh, and secondly, also the issue of the pressure on form that you talked about, the pressure of content on form. And you suggested a kind of hard, bare realism as one response. But I think uh, poets like Sassoon, Owen, uh, Rosenberg suggests that in fact poetry can be very useful because of its, you know, because of its anti-realist tendencies in turning this catastrophe into something that has a lot of emotional impact. So I don't think a hard, bare prose is the only correct response to a, a calamity. I think poetry can in fact uh, be very transformative. So that's one observation. Perhaps you could comment on that. And the second that I'd like to make is this uh, very paradigm that you set up, this disjunct between literature and catastrophe or calamity. I think this has a lot to do with the legacy of a certain liberal humanist vision of what the canon is. Uh, because a lit uh, in this liberal humanist vision, we tend to think of great literary works as those that aren't particularly rooted to one particular moment, say a Shakespeare play, which can be kind of uh, adapted to different cultures and different times. But I think, I think ever since post-colonialism, we have begun to move away from this li liberal humanist vision of what literature is, because post-colonialism deals with the contingent, deals with trauma, deals with crisis. So perhaps if you could uh, talk about these two things, one being um, whether uh, hard bare prose is necessarily the best response, perhaps poetry can transform calamity. And the second is whether we should discard or at least be critical of this paradigm of literature as being sort of timeless uh, ever since post-colonialism. So yeah. yeah. Uh, thank you so much, Prime. These are brilliant questions. Uh, just Anupurna, just for logistics, should I take more questions or should I go one by one? So you can go one by one, but if we have uh, you know associated questions, then I, I'll place it before you. All right, that's great. So thank you again, Prab, for uh, this, these are two brilliant questions, and probably get uh, to the focus and at the same time to the to the uh, to the root um, discussions um, that some of the challenges of representing art during a catastrophe. So one of the things I was thinking about is that probably it would be wrong on my part to say that uh, Shukanto's declaration in poetry 
uh, was was the correct or more uh, more um, useful one. I think Shukantos was probably a minority. Uh, if you could see that some of the poetry uh, circles in the 1940s and some of the magazines where people could publish their poems, there was already uh, a few such as Porichoy or such as Progoti, etc., from the Kollul tradition, etc., where there was like coteries, circles and coteries being built around. And we have seen even, uh, you know, sort of celebrated poets such as Jibunananda going through really uh, a very tense time of his life with Shonibar et Chiti, etc. So my, my feeling was that the kind of poetry that made Many of these magazines would celebrate, or many of these magazines would promote, was about uh, something that Shukanta was writing against, the kind of this uh, modernist, subjectivist, lyrical turn. And he is written in his uh, essays about, about that. And we have to also think he's just 20, uh, 19 or 20. Some of these responses are intense in, in, in his writing. So um, I think what Shukanta is doing is probably, as I said, is an exception to the rule. What is happening through Jimunanando, through Vishnu uh, De, through um, Shot, uh, Shot, um, Shudindranath, some of these responses coming in Bengali poetry are, as you can understand, these are stalwarts, Buddha Dev and others. And Buddha Dev, uh, was sort of met Shukanto during um, during a period, like uh, during his ailment, and said, like, you know, stop being a soldier, be a poet. You are actually killing a poet in you by being a soldier. Now, th this is a something that I think uh, something that Shukanto continually had to struggle. That what is actually poetry, and how do I write the right poetry to get into, and at the same time to capture the crisis. So this is uh, my my feeling is that this poetry that I sort of talk about, and maybe because this the meaning of it has been a bit neutralized because of the way that uh, the ruling government back then in Bengal has utilized the poem throughout in syllabuses, etc. I think this was more of a exceptional uh, kind of aesthetics that Shuganto was talking about. This is something that I've written in 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 the paper that I was reading out to some extent to give you. Uh, this is this is the kind of um, uh, the kind of response that a uh, few people, very few people, Shuganto has been celebrated both more politically by a ruling government than uh, for his for his art and aesthetics uh, to get to the second question i think this is key and i think you you are oh, this is this sorry, is something key just one interjection if i may right right uh, yeah antara here yeah yeah yeah, yeah so uh, i think there was also a question and 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 it came to my mind as well uh, and uh, there's a question in the chat window as well uh, about right. uh, uh, Adorno's uh, statement right. in context of uh, Auschwitz uh, that there, right. there, there cannot be any poetry after that. So if you could yeah. just act on that. Elaborate. Yeah, uh, yeah absolutely. I, thank you so much. Uh, point being that, you know, Adorno wrote about that. I think it's Minima Muralia. So I, I, anyway, I don't remember. But Adorno wrote about that there cannot be any poetry. But precisely what I thought my readings of Adorno show that they is we was absolutely for poetry. The point was not about. I think the point. I think something that Prayag was also mentioning the ethic, the ethics of like writing, the ethics of producing art. Most of this poetry coming out of the war. It doesn't mean that nobody writes about uh, the Holocaust. The Holocaust, to some extent, was a reminder that humanity is dead, that poetry in that sense cannot capture the the violence, the trauma, because if we are killing us so bluntly in the name of race and in the name of religion, then what is the point of producing um, sort of, you know, aesthetics, where aesthetics itself is dead, the aesthetics of death. So what Adorno's later writings also show that he was pointing towards not the death of his thesis as such, but a different kind of aesthetics to coming out of it. The the debate that he had uh, with um, not a, a lot of writers, especially with Lukács and then with Brecht and others, was not about the end of art. And Adorno would be the last person to say that poetry should die, right? But at the same time, my feeling was that he was they were all like Lukács's um, sort of attack on Beckett or modernist writers to some extent was also something that Brecht and uh, Adorno were passionately writing about how different kinds of arts uh, is coming out, which may not follow the same kind of formula rules that Lukács had in mind. And but interesting part is that it's also a regressive reading of Lukács. I feel Lukács was was an immensely complicated mind to some to some extent, but more than some some sort of a doctrinaire temper with which Lukács seems to talk about. So to to get back to uh, 
to the second question very quickly is that my feeling is that uh, of course like the liberal humanist part takes up uh, about uh, the kind of preconceived notion of art that we talk about my other uh, thinking is um, post colonial studies itself has opened up some of these discussions i'm talking about with rob nixon uh, pablo mukaji uh, mark anderson these are all uh, post colonial uh, critics to some extent and probably this is the spirit with which they have found out that okay let's find out different kind of art but these are also people who are think uh, and who have been thinking about how to represent an ecological crisis and this is uh, it could be so the mark anderson is talking about latin america how people have spoken about uh, let's say a disaster uh, of, of like a famine where which has given birth to more of a novelistic form and to him uh, the uh, disaster such as an earthquake in uh, saint dominica has given birth to a journalistic uh, sort of chronica form that he talks about so different kinds of the disaster according to him giving birth to different kind of forms which get to some extent a raymond william escovey sort of emergent or subdued but which could be sort of uh, you know dug out so maybe it is the task of people like some of the people like us who have read Uh, through these traditions, to some of these radical traditions, to find out where art should be, or how to sort of, uh, you know, recover art or artistic uh, tools or critical tools from some of this liberal humanist tradition, which could itself be uh, liberal humanist as a term itself be also neutralized and compromised in the way that some of the circles have used it. Uh thank you showed it so uh, i will uh, kind of read out uh, the other questions but before that because i have a, a related question actually so my right. question is more specifically about uh, you know modern uh, indian novel or or or, or uh, let's say bengali novel that you're talking about at this point of time so this comes from this you know because you're talking about form so we had a lot of talk a lot of discussion in other you know lectures about how uh, you know pandemic sort of yeah. uh, had a bearing upon uh, uh, the novelistic genre in 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 in, in 18th, 18th century uh, the play for, for example kind of brought in a certain kind of discipline uh, with uh, which we can associate you know the genre of the novel uh because you know plague was often associated with certain kind of excesses that were commit committed in society so uh right. you know licentiousness excesses so uh it it called for certain kind of discipline which is kind of inflected and reflected you know by the novelistic genre in the 18th century so i was very curious to know you know how a sort of you know novel not only you know responded but at the same time how novel right. as a genre was formed in response to these you know almost uh, you know uh, world changing events in the early 20th century particularly in the indian context be it the famine or be it the plague or whatever you know had happened that were happening at this point of time and all those right. catastrophic events so how how did they shape novel as a genre right right absolutely um just a very quick response to that uh, would be the that you know a uh, question that came out in the uh, in the first question as well that that the war for instance holocaust partition uh famine these are different kinds of catastrophes these are not similar but they might have similar you know repercussions impact so to say so for instance um a famine and a cholera these are two different kinds right a famine or an earthquake two different kinds look at the spectacular um sort of uh, uh, spectacular uh, media representations of an earthquake or a flood people dying or look at amphan the way it was represented because that's the rep that's the that's the immediate response how people are suffering and creating a sense of empathy within us to deal with it but something which is invisible uh, the coronavirus crisis how do you represent that you represent that uh, through maybe migrants walking through people dying i mean that's the challenge uh, in art right like even if you read you know about uh, the plague uh, that was the plague um Uh, journal of the plague year etc by defo defo was not taking uh, the form of a novel uh, he could have written De robinson crusoe as the journal of the plague year like he was not thinking about that he was thinking about a journal to keep details etc which could be read as a fictional uh, fictionalized sort of genre so my my feeling is that something that i have been dealing with as well in my writings um, is that this is precisely where the distinction needs to be brought out the different kinds of disasters asking for different kinds of genres not radically different 
sometimes giving birth look at graphic novel or twitter poetry new kinds of forms are rising in order to deal with some of the socio political challenges of today's be it related to religion caste genocide ethnicity refugee crisis different kinds of you know different kinds of uh, aesthetic formats are coming these are not radically different twitter poetry is also poetry graphic novel is also novel finally but different forms are emerging in order to capture and that's precisely where i find that if we note if we note how a disaster pans out if we note some of the impacts that it has we'll see also that if a form is coming to be born it is emerging it is being energetic then this is the re response that this disaster is breaking into within us this is the kind of thing that i could think about uh, even with the birth of some of these forms in the 19th, 18th and 19th century europe uh, thank you shorit yeah shorit i had a related question kind of yes. picking up from uh, uh, some of the things that you mentioned just now in response to this question so i right. uh, yeah yeah i've been thinking i mean i've been um, uh, trying to read a bit about uh, pandemics and transition and uh, kind of uh, picking up from what you said about different kinds of calamity different kinds of catastrophes demanding different uh, you know formal engagement and how uh, a, a cyclone or an earthquake or a tsunami is uh, perhaps uh, you know requires different kind of presentation and um, uh, and and the challenges of representing a pandemic for example or or illness and i was thinking about this that uh, while i was reading up a bit on the and 1918 the spanish flu uh, i i was uh, finding that uh, in fact there is uh, in fact not that much really uh, in terms of literary representation when we uh, uh, compare it to the world war for example so there's much more on the world war than on the spanish flu in terms of literary representation so i was kind of um, uh, two things Uh, come to my mind and i just wanted uh, you to reflect on it one is which which you just mentioned that uh, how how do you represent uh, the coronavirus for example so kind of i'm reminded of virginia woolf's uh, uh, on being ill where she says that literature does not have the language to uh, uh, you know it illness and the other is the question of um, the world war and the pandemic uh, and and how uh, there is much more representation of the democracy and i am just wondering why uh, is there uh, an idea of, uh, like michael rothberg talks about multidirectional memory and different different traumatic memories kind of jostling uh, in the public uh, space public memory so is is there an idea or or i mean how yeah or uh, when it comes to the world war is it something to do with uh, with a uh, uh, people nature uh, of it a culture is yeah whereas illness um, so yeah maybe some yeah yeah absolutely um sorry the final bit of your um uh, your comments was sort of breaking out uh, sort of uh, breaking apart a little bit so what i i think i i, I gathered both of these um the crux of them one is that literature doesn't have the adequate tool as you were as you're talking about the virginia wool the famous essay by virginia wool when i was thinking about uh, the other day i was talking about his book called viral modernism Uh, by elizabeth woodka and this came out in 2019 uh, and this book is about the first uh, page like the first sentence of this book is that while the spanish flu killed 20 million or 50 million people worldwide where is the literature of it like the literary work of it what why is it so difficult to find enough amount of work on on something like that while the war given uh, gave birth to so much uh during the interwar so some of these uh, some of these challenges i think have 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 been um, to a lot of the critics who are interested in these areas but routinely discouraged by the paucity of uh, material it's not that the material is not 
produce. It's probably that they were produced and they were not uh, uh, preserved, sort of kept um, kept with the intention that somebody else will will read it precisely because they were not probably great art. And uh, you know, this is something that I've also found out. So uh, the second question that you uh, deal with is about the about the multi-directional parts of memory and how to re re uh, remember. Uh, and a fantastic book by Rothberg, a traumatic realism that I also used in my work. I was thinking about um, uh, this thing precisely, that how to remember. And uh, this is a, probably a great time also for another thing about the statue debate worldwide, about, uh, especially in the Euro-American world, about whether it is a good idea to go on with the statues of imperialists and mass murderers in other parts of the world as figures of national pride in another country. So um, Churchill or Clive, etc., cetera, were responsible uh, for some of the famines in India. To some extent, Cecil Rhodes was responsible for uh, so many deaths in in Africa, especially South Africa. So whether we should this should this should have this should be there, and I think uh, this is this comes back to a question about how do we remember something, somebody or something, partly also because of the monumental architectural material space around, and partly also how they have come to us through generational talks. I don't know about the Bengal famine. I never knew when I grew up, my grandmother was directly um, affected by it. And then also um, the partition. And uh, they had to come from uh, today's Bangladesh to today's India. And she never spoke about it. She died when I was at the age of eight and she died. She never spoke about it. And I got to know a little bit about it from my father, but they never talk about it. Uh, is it something like that to think about that does a catastrophe of this nature where you have you have you have lost everything? Does it also stop, silence us from remembering them? And what are the way out then? How do you publicly memorialize something which has been so catastrophic that it has muted a whole generation, a generation after generation? I think the uh, Holocaust re uh, was responded with much more literary and critical works than the famine, which probably killed equally or even more and which was more taken as a casualty of war. So these are also questions, these are huge questions about how do we memorialize a catastrophe? Uh, how do you memorize or tra transgenerationally memorialize? I think this is precisely where my understanding is that we need to see them. So maybe like what the Irish have done in Ireland, they have, they have got like plenty of public memorials of the famine uh, in the, on the street. That's the legacy that they have. And we are, to some extent, uh, we don't. Uh, so some, that could be one way of memorializing the famine. Remember, remind us that we have come here through a lot. And the other thing would be to to talk about that, to do this kind of, or to dig out works that were there during the famine and that have been for or any kind of catastrophe to some extent and forgotten. And the challenges of it, which Su uh, Susan Sontag also talks about in her. Uh, famous essay uh, book called Illness as a Metaphor is also very important that sometimes illness, if it is a chronic illness, the challenges of being metaphorized and sort of uh, dehumanized and neutralized is also very high. How do you deal with these things? And the one way would be to remind us to talk about that, to remind it or to bring it back, to restore it where it should have been into the forefronts of our discussions of art and um, sort of violence. So these are these are uh, my. Dr. Bhattacharya, I had a. May I ask a question? Am I audible? Yes, you are. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, this is Anandita uh, from uh, HSS department. So uh, basically, uh, this is interesting that you uh, pointed out that you know we need to memorialize a lot of the um, you know like erect statues probably or some kind of memorials of catastrophe. Now in this connection, uh, you know right uh, right now what is going on with uh, Black Lives Matter and the all of a lot of statues so uh, right. another thing to really think about is uh, you know uh, what gets erected first of all and uh, right. what are the narratives that are constructed in order right. for those kind of uh, you know uh, memorials so to say uh, so right. uh, these memories are often uh, you know very acutely curated uh, right. so as to fit into a specific kind of narrative so right. uh, I'm just wondering that, uh, you know, when we talk about uh, these kind of disasters, so as you uh, pointed out that whenever we have, and Ankara was also mentioning, whenever we have very visible uh, catastrophes, mm -hmm. like war, or even, you know, the Dalit movement, a lot of writings mm -hmm. came out as a result mm -hmm. of that. So it was a visible 
violent mm. movement but what do we do with uh, so called invisible uh, not so invisible but uh, not so you know active stuff where we are mentally uh, you know facing a lot of things uh, and also physically so uh, mm. you know these kind of memories that get curated so what's your observation on that i would like to know Absolutely. a little bit about it thank you so much again for this question and this is probably a huge challenge not only for literary critics such, such as us or cultural critics but also for writers and i have been in talk with a few writers as well uh, asking them about their like you know uh, sort of uh, reactions so to say or maybe responses to it and uh, how much of it i mean most of it if you would see has uh, the kind of response to uh, the three month long catastrophe that we have been going through globally what has been the response the response the immediate response comes in a shorter form be it a poem be it like a be it like a facebook or a twitter post uh, this, because of course like you need to see how it pans out and you probably have to wait a little more to see how things go uh, you know for, from here for a year or so so even if uh, you want to write a long form such as a novel uh, or even a play uh there is a message that you are trying to deliver through everything art cannot be done without giving any kind of a message be it explicit or implicit it's a different thing the 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 artist is definitely trying to do something by producing and and you know sort of setting them in public um my my challenge has been and as with the famine and as with uh sort of diseases that cannot be seen the but you know that that but that is creating a huge amount of ruckus huge amount of social uproar chaos is where this chaos comes i mean we are dealing with art is dealing here with the consequences of it not at the root and we are artists we are not social i mean we are of course literary critics but artists are not social scientists they do not have the they do not have the imperative or the the sort of uh, urgency to historicize or to sort of argue for or against or to find out through ethnography etc um what it was like but at the same time an artist does everything like an ethnographer like um, sort of a reason like a reasoning individual or a citizen or a subject at the same time trying to produce art and this is precisely the challenge i think being within the catastrophic moment how do you you have the urgency and how do you now narrativize it inevitably you would see that all of these endless uh, narratives that some of these i have read are about the repercussions in human so the whole point is to either humanize or or in to some extent if i can use a di different way in, in a deconstructive sense dehumanize d hyphen humanize as in like you're trying to sort of get away with the anthropomorphic imagery and trying to find something different out of it that illness might be something different but in any sense and i do not have a ready-made answer to how to write about this invisible forms of catastrophes which is a again finally a catastrophe but at least what i can see writers are doing and have done previously about a famine where a person like look at the coronavirus pandemic it's not it might touch me we don't know we are insecure in that sense but at the same time it comes to food or it comes to life when it comes to uh, aspects we are home and not in a very bad desperate situation we're getting some of the things done to us and that's precisely the tension that is there that i am secure fine but at the same time i see when i want to go and see the world the world is suffering so this is the tension that is that is that is sort of probably asking tapsi panu or gulzar to write these poems a tension that is about the crisis of humanity but again as to un to answer your question there is this is going to be a challenging thing for an artist to talk about how to talk about invisible forms of violence but we need to be probably more patient and see even if these are coming in halted form and so we need to find out that this is probably the aesthetic uh, response to to the to the to the, to the challenge thank you thank you uh, uh, show, so before uh, shrinath if i could just yes. take a few yes. questions from the box uh, before uh, we move to your question because they're waiting for a long yeah, time yeah. So, sure, sure, yeah, go. Yeah. So, uh, Shorat, I'm going to plug a few questions together because you have answered quite a few of them. And, uh, so, but you, you right. might kind of feel like adding something uh, to those. Uh, so, one comes from Stella. So, uh, she asks that you know, would you opine that you know, fiction often falls short in meeting the urgency and expectations of a particular crisis situation? The second question comes from Debo Bruto. Uh, uh, he says, in this poem, Oh Great Life, the poet is kind of bidding adieu to the genre of poetry. 
for its supposed incompatibility with the narration of the harsh reality of catastrophe. And he chooses that particular genre only to express that disagreement. So how to address the simultaneous association and dissociation from the experience of catastrophe vis-a-vis -vis literature? And finally, Shorab has a question, says, uh, you know, he, his question is on climate uh, change fiction or climate fiction. Uh, how can that contribute in bringing awareness about the climate crisis we are facing? So these are the three questions. Yeah, yeah, thanks. thanks. Uh, yeah, I'm just like noting them down so that I don't forget. So thank you so much again uh, for your questions. I'll go one by one and be quick um, so that we also uh, keep these things in time. So the first thing is about fictions falling short of the urgency. Um, I I am I am particularly um, I'm particularly in favor of fiction not falling short precisely because uh, we are talking about the crisis, right? Uh, but of course, it will not go into um, in according to my my expectations, of course. But uh, at the same time, think about what does fiction do? Uh, to fictionalize is what? To fictionalize is to bring a social reality outside and give it some kind of an aesthetic or literary form. To fictionalize, to make it a fiction out. That, does that even mean that uh, fiction or fictionalizing doesn't have the rules of social reality? I mean, like, just to give you a very uh, weird response would be that uh, if we think about Harry Potter, um, does the rule of reality, social reality, not work there? I mean, the life that we see in Harry Potter is the same life that is uh, a novel about a school and a social setting of a school and uh, very strict disciplines, etc. could talk about. But then you know that there, are, there is magic and people can fly and people can turn into animals. People can be. So these are these are the challenges where you know that they're transgressing what is known as conventionally as realism. But that doesn't mean that the rules of reality do not partake in the fantastic world, so to say. So to come back here, if we find our current world as beyond the real, irreal, or to some extent unreal, then we have to twist reality or the way that the so-called conventional forms of representing reality and give it form. So my response was, is, is actually fiction falling short or are we not being able to locate those fictions? I mean, why does it is it so that climate fiction automatically has given birth to genre fiction? So climate crisis has given birth to more of a genre fiction. Could it be called a genre fiction? If to answer the second, uh, like to like tie it together with the third uh, question, uh, climate uh, crisis has given birth uh, to climate fear, whether these things could be read as climate fiction. I mean, like, you know, this is up to a lot uh, depends on people like us who are reading them, readers, and at the same time, people like us were criticizing them, were critiquing them in the formal capacity of an academic or a teacher. Now, if climate crisis has given birth, as Amitav Ghosh has also said in The Great Derangement, into stories, but those stories which are understood as also genre fiction, be it horror fiction, gothic fiction, science fiction, speculative fiction, whatever, this is a different kind of fiction, as if, if Jane Kudzia writes a novel, writes a novel, and that will be fiction. But if, let's say, um, uh, uh, sort of Margaret Atwood writes a novel, it could be science fiction, something, an adjective has to be added to that. So that is something we need to challenge, that where what is fiction in the world of climate crisis or in the time of a catastrophe, and whether it is actually feeding back to us uh, with our expectations about fiction. To talk about the final, uh, the second question about uh, disagreements and agreements about poetry, again, an excellent question. Thank you. It is about, so my um, readings of Shukanto would be that he is a poet. He is a particular, um, very few, he has written almost whatever I've read about Shukanto, Shukanto Shomogro. It's hardly any uh, short story or any other form. He actually is in poetry and letters, poetry and letters. So letters are mostly personal and he's signing them off as a as a letter writer. And letter writing epistolary itself has a aesthetic tool, but it, these are letters collected. And he, uh, he's writing letters as consciously as a letter writer here, and he's writing poetry. So if he has deliberately chosen to talk about the catastrophe through poetry and is finding it so difficult 
to talk about the catastrophe in poetry because it's not finding precedence. And precisely because 1919 famine, sorry, 1919 influenza in Bengal or 1817 cholera or 1897 uh, plague in Bombay and then the bubonic plague in Bengal, all of these things have not given him a precedent to fall back on in terms of poetry writing. So what is he doing? He's sort of giving a challenge, a declaration that, okay, poetry needs to be something different. But the irony is that he's still using poetry. So it's not that poetry is that, that is the purpose, is that the challenges, or as you said, the simultaneous agreeing and disagreeing with uh, the kind of form is precisely what we can capture is coming out of uh, an aesthetic form or aesthetic challenge during a catastrophe. And that's something I'm more interested in, in short. Uh, so before we go to, you know, some live questions from uh, we have Srinath waiting. But before that, I'll quickly uh, ask two more questions uh, from the chat box. And then we can take right. a couple of more, you know, uh, from from uh, here. So uh, one pertains to Bijan Bhattacharya's, uh, you know, Nobanno. And uh, the question is about hunger, the representation, how hunger is represented or how hunger represents the political, uh, you know, scenario. So that's a question from Mohua. So if you could address right. that. Right. Yeah, I'm just noting them down. So thank you uh, for your question. I think uh, that's also, again, very interesting, isn't it? That if we read Nobanno, uh, New Harvest, we know that Bijan Bhattacharya was deeply influenced by Brext and um, sort of the epic theater. And if you remember the first scene um, where what is happening is that like Mother Courage, if you read Mother Courage by Brext, uh, Nobanno also has people in chorus, um, scene after scene setting up with banners, etc. Uh, some sort of a epic, the epic notion of a collectivity. In Nobanno starts with how uh, the 1942 uh, cyclone and the agitations in Medinipur, etc. Um, were responsible for the social crisis leading to the famine later on, of course, the war and the famine. And then remember one thing that the way Calcutta was affected by the war was not the same for, let's say, uh, Purulia or for Jalpaiguri. Um, of course, that these are also affected and these are closer to the Eastern kind of uh, tension going on there. But at the same time, Calcutta is the metropolis, right? So most, um, some of these challenges would be much much higher. People would come to Calcutta after the famine to, in a, to get some sort of a support, relief support and pattern. So uh, the representation of hunger in um, Nobanno was was in quick shots, if you remember. Like it's not a very long play. There are episode after episode, so episodic in nature, and uh, there are this what is called as snapshots. And if you read, and I'm sure you know about uh, that already, that um, Slobano had a 25th year edition, uh, memorial edition, and where a lot of people actually wrote about uh, how Romano was produced. And um, Shombu Mitra was behind it in the stage directions. And he uh, gave interviews to Shomik Bandhavadhyay about how the stage needed to be directed in a much more uh, different way than actually how um, we, they have done, even with some of the some of the other uh, plays. So uh, tiny shacks could be built, sort of uh, spidery web-like things could be uh, around to give a feel. And the stage had to be very minimal and with the with the props like that. So, and, and the changes in lighting, something that modernist uh, play and uh, plays had also sort of exploited to the fullest, the lighting, the light and shade. So what, there, there could be even this set of new challenges that two scenes together, one would be stopped by shutting off uh, the light, like you know, switching it off, and the other could be shown by just sort of uh, putting the light on to that. So both of them are going simultaneous, the simultaneity of things. So these are the changes that Bijan Bhattacharya are bringing in order to talk about the, let's say the class divide in hunger, that somebody is eating from the garbage, while somebody else is actually enjoying a, a wedding ceremony. So the class divide of hunger and the simultaneity of it, all. And the challenges of form that, and this definitely had uh, shocked a lot of people. The initial responses to this uh, play were not very happy. Or were, I mean, as you could understand, that it was actually shocking for the establishment that somebody could write and produce something like that in such a rude and uh, brutal fashion. But then again, if you would know that uh, Harvard, like Nobanno, was responsible single-handedly for, for popularizing IPTA. 
uh, Indian People's Theatre Association. So and um, you know, so many uh, sort of productions of Nobanda in different languages were done across India throughout in the ne in the next years. Um, so point uh, being, uh, so Nandi Bhatia has a book called Acts of Authority, which is brilliant in, in some of these discussions. So point being that, um, again, a theater or playwright had to think about something different. And if you remember how Bijan Bhattacharya was thinking about how to give form about people and uh, dying, uh, like cats and dogs, um, again, the challenges about that, and even today, 2020, we could like, why would he compare uh, uh, challenges of people dying with cats and dogs as if cats and dogs are not important enough? Again, a new form could come out and people might critique some of these expressions as well. So the point being that new challenges are, are being born and they're given form differently in existing in existing genres. And that's why I said like Twitter poetry is also poetry. Uh, so, thank you, Shorit. Uh, next, we're going to take Srinath's question, and Paloma is on the queue. So, Srinath, could you right. please have it? Hi, hi. So, what, what immediately comes to my mind as I was listening to your talk is the idea of sublime, where one elicits aesthetic pleasure by keeping aesthetic distance from the intimidating object. So one criticism which is often pitted against is this view is that both the author and the reader are actually cashing in on the misery of the other. So uh, I was wondering, where do you position uh, this literature dealing with catastrophe in the realm of aesthetics? Uh, what does it aim to achieve ultimately? Does it aim to jar the readers out of their complacency? Does it aim to disturb the readers? Uh, I was uh, 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 in general concerned about the, uh, uh, the, the, the final agenda of uh, this sort of literature. Uh, what right. does it aim to achieve, at least? Yeah. Right. Thank you so much, Srinath. And that's probably um, that's a crucial question. And that's probably a question that uh, some of these writers were also, that I, I was talking about in the uh, earlier part of the talk, had to deal with. Um, absolutely. Like when you talk about um, a literature of catastrophe, the concept of sublime as aesthetic come to us. And I think Burke talked about the French Revolution, Edmund Burke talked about the French Revolution, the manner of the sublime. And uh, the sublime has come down to us as something which is aesthetically impossible to talk about, right? Like sublime as the gigantic, the beautiful, the transgressive, something that is so difficult to define. Yes. Now, this is something, this itself, I believe, has a value uh, sort of judgment add to that, that something that we cannot uh, understand in so-called everyday or routine terms or sort of genres, that is something that is transgressive in format. I My understanding is that if you remember um, uh, in so Bhavani Bhattacharya, one of the tensions that he was going through, I'm sure, and that he wanted to be formed to his in his writing is in, in the novel So Many Hungers is that should the artist who was sketching about um, a mother who was dead, but a child was suckling off the dead mother, should should he continue uh, photographing this or sketching this and then print them later on or post them, whatever form is allowed back then? Uh, is there a sense of profit associated with it? A sense of um, sort of some sort of an immediate response. And this is a very difficult question. And that's precisely where I think the challenges come in, that should I talk about that? Is it becoming more exhibitionistic? Is it becoming more commercialized, more profit driven? And look at some of the challenges. I mean, uh, you know, a few days back, we spoke about Amphan and how national, a uh, lot of other media were not projecting uh, the suffering or ab about the about the cyclone. But at the same time, I remember like in about the Kerala floods, we um, so much of it was uh, about um, what was happening in Kerala and what what were the things back then and how to sort of you know how to how to sort of help how to generate more help and awareness. My point is that it was it as you said it was in a sense some of these images are agenda driven. Of course, it wants to incite within us, um, provoke in us a sense of immediate affective response, and at the same time. If we could help financially as well, at the same time, if somebody such as Barkha Dutt, who has uh, done wide, uh, who has kind of come to fame through her uh, journalism during the Kargil War in the late 
90s, uh, something that we also remember them for. How much is, is actually about imparting knowledge to a society through a social media or news media, and how much is about personally enjoying or uh, personally sort of uh, exploiting something out of it is a, a question. But I take your point that there is an agenda, and this is something that people have talked about, especially uh, other people, that there is a propaganda in some of these kinds of art. My feeling is that propaganda is implicitly or explicitly inbuilt into art because there is a message. But at the same time, maybe from within the moment of the disaster, writers and artists are much more vulnerable and much more uh, sort of um, clueless would be probably a very bad word, much more inclined to project about some of these things, which they also feel badly about that others are not feeling the same about. As if it is not true, all of us are, might be equally shocked by some of these things, but look at how many times we see people are uh, being so shocked and angry and uh, writing about social media while others, why others are not thinking the same right, right now. So this is, I think, a very uh, immediate response. But again, I would say that sublime is also not outside of value, the way we talk about sublime or at the same time anything that we talk about as a better art is not outside of value it's just that where we project them and how do we respond to them if we continue to read uh, Rabindranath Tagore or Prem Chand or um, let's say uh, Ismat Chuktai and these are the like the you know, makers of modern Indian writings to some extent etc are we already giving them ascribing them uh, by bringing them together in a bracket to some form of value and is it outside of uh, the concept of greatness or the concept of you know some lasting impact that we have in mind so these are things that we continuously need to sort of question I think uh, yes so Shorit, um, we're going to take a couple of other questions but before that, before winding up, but uh, there's one question, a very interesting question about genre. So this comes from Paloma, Paloma Chatterjee, uh, and her question is about, so what about literature from socio-geographical spaces like Nagaland, where colonial rule overruled the native language? Uh, can memory of the colonized be recollected in the term of the colonizer? Can almost every literature from these spaces be catastrophic literature as they voice the colonial and neo-colonial damages that rule deep in the minds of the writers? Absolutely. Fantastic question again. Thank you. Um, so in my book, in the beginning, uh, what I have tried to give an understanding of is that colonialism, uh, colonialism is synonymous with catastrophe. I mean, if it is synonymous with modernity, then modernity is synonymous with catastrophe. I mean, this is something that I have built uh, in the book through some readings, historical and literary readings. But uh, to give it one example, um, so uh, Shumit Sarkar, one of the noted uh, historians of, uh, of India and wrote a book called Modern India, among many other things that for him, colonialism and uh, the kind of agricultural traditions, the agrarian crisis that it had given birth to by the different kinds of land relations, be it the permanent settlement or the Rayadhari, etc. Some of these land relations uh, and the imposing of, let's say, the extraction of resources and the production, the overbearing production of cash crops in the place of food crops. Uh, a lot of these historians say that have given birth to a series of planets. Not only a series of famines, but also uh, famines leading to epidemics, other forms. So many of these epidemics, modern kinds of epidemics, are understood to be brought to us from outside in a very ironic manner, in the same way that coronavirus is understood to be brought to us from outside. So in a sense, I believe that if epidemics and disasters and famines were related with the way that colonialism and colonial science had defined architecture, the kind of agrarian crisis that we are still going through with farmer suicides almost almost like every um, every day basis, then the literature that will come out supposedly should be about, about some of these tragedies. But unfortunately, or maybe like it is there, you do not find a lot of noted literature talking about it. And this is precisely where we are, we are going back to again and again, what is the note the more visible literature and are they not talking about that actually i'm thinking I'm, I'm doing a work on the agricultural novel and i see that from 1920s onward more and more writers are writing about the rural 
not because suddenly the rural had become a great place, but also because Mahatma Gandhi's call for uh, sort of rural modernity, that tradition is something which is not unchanging. It is accommodative and it is uh, evolving in form. And then you see that the most famous one would be Kanthapura, right? Uh, Raja Rao's, that the kind, kind of, it, it's given birth to a Gandhian rural novel. And then this tradition has gone and some of these uh, things would be there in so many other writings coming out in different languages. It could just be that some of the Naga writings, uh, some, of the, uh, some of the writings that are coming out recently, so sort of tens of hours and others, are they're writing in English. And that's the challenge again, right? What language are they writing in? Are they being translated into English? Do we see them? Do they participate in the visualization of literature, what we know about literature? So to answer your question, if we think about colonialism as giving birth to modernity, which is full of crisis and catastrophe, then the literature of its time has to capture it. And maybe it is now when more and more literature are being translated into English from different parts that we can see some of these things happening. So, of course, uh, the literature can be read in that framework. And this is what I'm trying to do in this book. Uh, to read different kinds of catastrophes, a political a famine, and then I'm reading Naxalite insurgency related writings as insurgency as a catastrophe, and then the emergency, uh, the, the state of emergency in India as counterinsurgency as another form of catastrophe, political terror as a kind of catastrophe. So these are things that I believe that if you read uh, literature from 1940s to 2000 or today, you can see a continuity which is ruptured, different catastrophes demanding different kinds of crisis, demanding different kinds of literary style, but which also plenty of convergences could be found. And this is where what I did in the book on catastrophic realism, finding out those divergences and convergences in writing. I'm sure we have many more interesting questions, but you can write to, because we are running out of time. So you can write to Shorit for, you know, more clarifications and discussions. We will share his email ID. Uh, but, but for now, we could take one last question before I hand over the session to Antara uh, for the final words. So if anybody interested can, uh, you know, ask uh, one last question. Um, Yeah, I think I will I will take over now and give Shorit a break. Uh, uh, thank you, Shorit, for uh, that extremely interesting and insightful uh, talk and uh, for being so patient with the questions. And uh, it, it has uh, really been a wonderful start to our proposed webinar series. And I'd like to thank everyone uh, for being here, for their interest and for their presence in making this um, very successful. And uh, yeah, unfortunately we have run out of time. So I think, uh, and Shorit has been talking for like two hours. So <laughs> let's uh, kind of be a bit considerate now. And you can uh, uh, please write to him as Anuparna said, uh, if you, uh, yeah, his, his email is visible on the slide. So uh, then uh, I can see a bit of an incorrect. So Shorit, uh, uh, there is no comma. Shorit dot Bhattacharya at Glasgow dot AC dot UK. That's the, the correct email one. Okay, so I'd like to end with thanking Shorit once more and uh, with thanking the audience. And it was really great to uh, listen to this talk. And we look forward to reading your book. Thank you so much, uh, Antara. Thank you so much, Anuparna, and the team for having me. And thank you so much for all the participants and for asking questions and being with me. Thank you so much. And I wish you all the best, Antara and team, for the next uh, sort of